Hello, and welcome to our Digital Futures Legends series with Elizabeth Diller. I will be your host, Virginia Melnick, and I'm very happy to be speaking with Elizabeth Diller today, who is the founding partner of Diller Scafidio Renfo, a design studio whose practice has spanned the fields of architecture, urban design, installation art, media performance, digital media, and print since it was established in 1981. Alongside her co-founder, Ricardo Scafidio, Liz Diller was the first architects to receive the MacArthur Foundation's Genius Grant, which stated, started Diller Scafidio as a firm. Together, they have created alternative forms of architectural practice that unites design, performance, electronic media, culture, and architectural theory and criticism. Their work explores how space functions in our culture and illustrates that architecture, when understood as a physical manifestation of social relationships, is everywhere, not just in buildings. Diller is also one of the only architects to have twice been distinguished by Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, being included in 2009 as well as in 2018. More recently, she was inducted into France's Ordo des Arts et des Laudrettes by the French Minister of Culture, and she was elected as the Wolf Prize Laudrette by the President of the State of Israel, and was appointed a member of the Habitat Council of Urban Initiatives by the United Nations. Diller Scofidio Renfo has completed some of the largest architecture and planning initiatives in New York City's recent history, including the High Line, a 1.5 mile long park, as well as Lincoln Center's Performing Arts Center. Diller has also led two projects that have reshaped New York City's cultural landscape, the surgical renovation of the MoMA and the Shed, a startup multi-arts institution originally conceived by Diller, Scofidio, and Renfo. The studio has worked with global institutions to expand and access to culture and to the public space. The Broad Contemporary Art Museum in Los Angeles has welcomed the youngest and most diverse of its demographic into the museum as well as developing the v a storehouse which is currently under construction in london which will bring much of the collection out of storage and into the public view for the first time diller scofidio's approach to rethinking cultural institutions and civic spaces grows out of the self-generated on alternative projects that blur the boundaries between architecture art performance and as a co-creator producer director the studio's most recent self-generated work, the mile-long opera, a choral performance featuring a thousand singers atop of the High Line, is one of Liz Diller's projects. The research has curated and designed a number of interactive installations and projects around the world. So today we are hoping to speak to Liz about her inspirations and life and how they have come together to shape these projects. So with that, welcome Liz. And perhaps starting out with some of the early age experiences as uh, she was born in Poland and moved to the US at an early age. So I would love to hear about some of that experience and what that meant to you as a young child or how it's affected you now as an adult and designer. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Virginia, for the introduction and, and also um, for inviting me to this. Um, I'll tell you what I remember, which is very little. Uh, actually, when I, was, when I was a kid in Poland, um, my family was um, uh, well-to-do. Um, uh, however, my parents had survived the Holocaust um, uh, and, you know, back then they, they decided to move to France sometime along the way they decided to return to Poland. And that's where I was born, um, but we were never really welcome in Poland. So uh, it, it felt um, post-war sort of, uh, you know, quite difficult, I think, for my family. 
uh, and while we were comfortably comfortable uh, materially, um, we just um, you know uh, were quite secular uh, Jews, but um, still there was a lot of anti-Semitism in the country, and uh, never really quite um, comfortable. Um, but my memories don't go uh, that far back. But when we left, when I was about five, um, you know, my parents had basically surrendered everything they had. You know, their uh, their their you know their their home. Uh, my father was originally Czech. My mother's Polish, but basically decided to go to America. So um, you know, it's a story of immigrants. Uh, wanting a better life for their kids. And um, uh, when we arrived in New York, um, and, and it was, I should say, it was quite difficult to get out of Poland. We needed um, exit visas and uh, we needed um, sponsors uh, and so forth. And, and you know, ultimately we came, um, settled in. Um, my parents um, uh, worked very hard. Um, and basically from nothing, and they had to leave everything behind and, and just built kind of a comfortable uh, middle-class existence for me and my brother. And uh, I um, remember just very, very little of, of Poland, but I was brought up um, with a European background nevertheless, because my parents um, are both European. Uh, they first started speaking English in America very slowly. My mother was extraordinarily uh, slow to assimilate. Uh, my father was much faster. He's very good with languages. And so for me, from let's say first grade, where that was my first experience um, in school, to about third grade, I remember nothing because I was just learning the language and, and generally from TV. <laughs> so you know, those, those um, uh, kind of silly shows, uh, comedies. And, uh, and so that was my formation in a kind of funny way it was it was from TV out, uh, outward. I was very shy in school because I didn't understand what was going on. And in those days, when uh, you didn't speak the language, they put you into a class of um, slow learners. Um, so it included, you know, everyone that had, you know, um, problems emotionally, um, mentally, uh, the, you know, immigrants were all pulled together with, you know, and, and it was very difficult actually to, um, uh, to really sort of engage in the work, you know, I, I had very few friends. By third grade, I started to get my bearings and I started to understand what was going on. And that's when I started to learn, truly read, um, and, um, and, and my memories started then. So it's a long way of saying, I don't remember much. <laughs> I wonder even though if you don't have specific memories about early age, if there's this idea of perseverance or endurance that your parents may be embedded in you or having that kind of traumatic change of life um, happening at such an early age that has made you very strong as you've gotten older um, or as just kind of, it's embedded within your personality? You know, I, I think so. I, I, my parents, um, neither of them uh, went through college, right? Um, and they wanted more than anything for my, my brother and I to have a good education. Um, and they put us through school and they were, um, uh, my, my, my brother was very interested in engineering and, uh, and he went on to become a bioelectronic engineer and he's excelled at what he did. Um, I was interested in art um, and I was kind of a, a kid that didn't really listen to anything at anyone. And, and I just wanted to do my own thing. I was very sort of focused on uh, independence. Um, my parents really didn't want me to have a career and they couldn't, you know, because being immigrants and having to um, take this big leap, um, you know, with, with family, having endured the war, having, you know, when I think back on um, the traumas that they went through, um, you know, I think my life is, is super simple and, and easy, but for, from their point of view, it was very, very important 
for me to be independent, for me to have a career. And my mother, um, you know, always said, um, uh, you know, be independent of men. You know, she was um, a feminist in her own way. And she really um, pushed me to, uh, you know, to think totally independently. Um, and, uh, but, you know, re regarding career, um, I think they thought in a more conventional way about what a profession was. And for me, I was just simply interested in follow following my curiosity and my instincts and um, stimulation. And at a, a certain point, uh, my parents um, uh, uh, put me into an art school, uh, allowed me to take art classes um, on, on Saturdays. Those were painting classes. And I was, I was in elementary school at the time and I learned to paint. And, um, you know, my mother, you know, had those paintings uh, on her wall, you know, her whole life. I mean, those really horrible paintings I did as an eight and nine year old. Um, but it was, it was interesting for me, you know, it was never really the route I wanted to take um, as a painter. And I didn't, this was all figurative work and still lifes and, you know, the kinds of things that they teach in those kinds of classes. But what it did was it, it um, made me start to look maybe more closely at the world, you know, and, and that's what um, brought me to want to go to a special uh, high school, which was the High School of Music and Art. And at the time, that was one of the five special schools in, um, in New York um, that, that uh, had lots of classes in those specific uh, categories. And, and so um, in high school, I was surrounded by artists and musicians. And that was um, kind of life-changing for me to have a different milieu. Um, and uh, the school was situated inside of City College. Um, so in, uh, in Harlem and for me to be in basically a context of college students in a high school, in a, in a college, um, and this was through, um, let's say the late sixties, early seventies. And it was a time when there was a lot of, um, unrest, student unrest and, you know, anger about the war and, um, so what I remember from that is just being liberated all the time by the college students, um, throwing lots of stuff out the window and um, sort of, you know, being uh, quite free. Um, I didn't go to that many classes. We were protesting most of the time. So it was, it was kind of an interesting, you know, moment for me of um, sort of passing into adulthood with quite a bit of um, uh, freedom and independence and, and then trying to figure out what to do next. I think that's really interesting. Um, I love hearing about your days as a rebel uh, in high school. <laughs> I, I think so that kind of leads me into these thoughts about performance and art because you went to an art high school um, and this is maybe where you were first introduced to some artists and, and different um, types of performance or musicians. And I wonder specifically uh, when some of these specific interests started to develop, was it in high school or more later? Um, and maybe you have some um, yeah. specific people also that you'd like to mention. No, I, I uh, in high school, I was mostly introduced to different media, you know, photography, um, sculpture, um, a sort, of, um, sort of installations, large um, sort of ways of thinking about space, you know, intersecting space. So off of the 2D world and more in the 3D world and with the use of technology also. So I think for me, it was quite eye-opening though some of my friends were musicians. And um, so getting interested in music was also um, was also something that it was a new world for me, um, and, and we're talking about classical music and uh, and a more experimental music. But this was super early um, in my formation. Um, in high school, at the very end of high school, you know, the question was what to do um, next. And uh, um, my parents didn't have you know a tremendous amount of money to send me to a you know um, you know one of the you know, 
like best schools in, in, the, in the country. And I didn't really, my, uh, I knew I would have to be close to home. I knew I would have to live at home and go to a local school. And um, I applied to several schools. Um, and uh, um, among them was NYU. And NYU, um, I, for some reason, I can't even remember why, they had an art and education program. And I thought, okay, I'll do that. Um, I, I was miserable my first year in college. I, you know, just I, I totally did not focus. And what I did focus on was my interest in Cooper Union. And that was a school um, nearby and which when I was in high school, nobody introduced me to, and I didn't really know my way around. You know, not, not like today where your college careers are planned when you're in kindergarten. <laughs> in those days, you know, I mean, yeah, people didn't really know what they were doing until they were right there, you know, facing college. So, but for me, I was really in the wrong place at NYU. And um, consequently, I was truly bad, you know, and I, I didn't, I really didn't go to classes. I. I was very inattentive, but I found out a way of sneaking into Cooper Union. <laughs> this was the place I wanted to be. And I went, I was very interested in photography and I had friends at Cooper Union. So they, they found a way of getting me in and I used their facilities. So this was not recommended for all the students out there <laughs> listening. Um, as you said, I was a rebel and I was a bit of a dissident. You know, I, I, I just thought that was my way of sort of, I, I didn't really have access. So I, I needed to find a way of, of getting that access. And so I was, I was quite creative when I was there. I didn't take classes, of course, um, and I was undercover, but I was creating photography. And um, I was in this, in the old days when you were developing, you know, photos and chemistry. And, um, and somehow my photos got noticed by um, the head of the photo department and at uh, Cooper. And I was invited to interview with him at Cooper. Um, and I think he, 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 now that I remember, he saw my photographs in my high school yearbook. And so, you know, he said, uh, I, I, I met with him and he said, um, you should really apply for the school. You know, your, your work is quite beautiful. And I said, well, you'd be surprised, but I'm already here. I'm already using your facilities. And he said, get out of here. <laughs> you know, he was so furious you know, that I had broken through the wall and he was, he was furious. So I, at that point, I felt like, hey, maybe I could make it if I applied, you know, uh, because I had, I, I didn't have such great self-confidence um, at the time. And, and that gave me the boost and I applied and, and I got, I got in and Cooper Union um, was, and has been for a very long time until recently, um, the only private uh, tuition free school in the country and it um and it was an excellent school so a great place for art architecture and engineering and um i was in the art school for uh, quite some you know two years until i started to even think about architecture i right? even you know admitted it into my brain but at this time you know just coming back to your question of influence this is where my um my sense of where I was in the world, where art was, where, um, you know, what was really happening in New York. Um, Cooper Union is right on 8th Street and, you know, just um, a couple of blocks away, there was the, you know, the most incredible art scene really in the world at the time. Um, and yes, and there were people that were, you know, greatly influential to me. And I was, I was seeing um, all sorts of, work and performance. I was I'm thinking about Mabu Mines and Carl Armitage and um, uh, Foreman. And um, I was seeing um, uh, Trisha Brown, you know, um, in performance, you know, there are many performing artists and Phil Glass and, and Steve Reich, um, all of that performing arts, but also visual arts. And I was, I was particularly interested in performance art like Vito Acconci and um, with with Vito I was uh, I was I was interested in this crossover work between performance and art um, so the following piece the seed bed you know things like that where he used space and he used um, the urban context 
Um, but at the, and at the same time, you know, maybe not so close at hand, but was Smithson, I was interested in Smithson's work, Smithson's work, uh, Gordon Matt Clark, um, you know, who was cutting up buildings, Smithson that was doing um, large um, environmental works um, in the ground um, and, and things like that. So, you know, those were, um, there were many more, but those were early influences um, where uh, I started to um, uh, to think about, uh, you know, well, what was it that I truly was interested in? I was, I realized I was interested in space making. So if you think about Trisha Brown, a choreographer, she was walking on the uh, sides of buildings. She was dancing horizontally. Um, she was, you know, um, dancing on rooftops, you know, with scattered, uh, her scattered troop on roo rooftops. Um, this was like, you know, totally, uh, uh, you know, paradigm shifting work in dance. But what was so interesting about it was that it was definitely at the intersection of, um, of architecture, urbanism, um, and uh, generally the arts and all of those people that I mentioned, plus many more, I was, there, there were also influences from the West Coast. Um, and, you know, I, I I think it wasn't so much that it had to be local, local, but it was just who was influencing who and how this sort of thriving art scene in the 70s um, was totally transforming on New York and what New York meant. It was a place of, uh, um, it, was a, it was a place of production. It was a place of an innovation. Um, the rules didn't matter. Um, rents were cheap. It was mostly Soho and people were either buying or renting these loft spaces that were um, vacated and, and they were very, very cheap. And, and you know, I regret that I didn't have any money then because they became you know, some of the most expensive real estate later on. But, um, but in those days, it, it liberated artists from the confines of the gallery, you know, of the four walled gallery and you know of the concert hall you know and the traditional spaces um, that were meant for presentation and performance so that's why new forms began because those spaces that were traditionally um, you know seen for their for their presentation were challenged you know in a very strong way yeah i think that you're right, New York at that time was so influential and all of the art scene that was going on there. Um, I wonder also at Cooper Union, this was early years of John Hayjuk as uh, the head of the school. And if you had any influence from him as well, since he was really um, at least one of the main leaders of the this school for so long and really created one of the strongest curriculums and pedagogy at the Cooper Union. Yes, I, I was um, in the art school for yeah. two years. Um, I took a course called architectonics um, because I was, I was sort of curious and actually my boyfriend at the time was an architect in the architecture school. And so yeah, I was exposed um, a little bit to architecture. I thought, okay, what the hell? I'll take this course. I don't know what architectonics meant, you know. So, um, and so while I was in the art school, and that was the moment that I first met John Hadek, and he he wasn't teaching that class. He was the dean of the school, but he was this looming figure, you know, six foot six, wild hair, big, you know, really big bear of a man with a thick Bronx accent, holes in his sweater, you know, um, and his. You know, his um, outlook was that um, he was against, you know, really the profession. He was, he was there sort of representing the culture of architecture, but not so much the profession. And he was very, I think he was very, uh, you know, suspect of uh, the profession that it was, it, it, you know, it was kind of corrupt. And, you know, therefore he, he did very little architecture of his own. He did beautiful paintings and um, he made books and, and he made these uh, projects on paper that were really fantastic. He built uh, just a couple of things. And one of the things that he built was actually Cooper Union, the renovation of the foundation building. 
uh, where the school ultimately where I went to school. Um, but anyway, this this man um, spoke in riddles, like he didn't speak normally. He didn't say what you know what architecture was. He everything was oblique but poetic, and I was totally fascinated by him. And somehow I understood. I don't you know like to this day, I can't tell you how I understood, but I un I kind of decoded it, and it was all it was you know, I don't know, somehow it was cerebral and it was from the heart. And um, I also loved his work. It was very beautiful. Um, I, and he brought in a lot of very interesting faculty that created a unique place in the world. And there was another unique place that was the AA in London at the time. And there was a good partnership in a way, an exchange between the AA and Cooper Union. Um, I decided to transfer to the architecture school. And the reason um, that I wanted to do that was I, I felt that there was a discourse and I realized that um, I, I like to speak about my work and I like to be challenged intellectually. And in the art school, it was a lot of freedom and you could do what you want, but you never had to be accountable to a set of ideas um, like the rigor and the discipline in architecture school where you have a brief, you do something, you respond to it, and then you have to you have to defend it when you're challenged. And I realized that this was much more my element because it kept kept me disciplined and thinking. Nevertheless, I was going to all the performances downtown and um, uh, and sort of taking in the whole scene. And, and my influence was more in the art scene, but my education was at Cooper Union School of Architecture where I was um, quite, you know, quite involved in breaking the rules there because that was my MO. And um, I, I, I must add that in my class was an older student. He was, I was in my, um, I was, you know, a couple, couple of years later than some of my fellow students because I'd already been in the art school and then I, I transferred, but I was like a year or two older. But there was a 35 year old um, in, in the class and who was a, musician and a pianist um, for Steve Reich and had also worked with Phil Glass. And so through him and discussions about architecture in class, I was able to connect to him. And he was my, he was my hinge between the world that I was most fascinated by and, uh, uh, and Cooper where I was studying and I was really learning about you know, the history of architecture, culture of architecture, and learning how to, uh, the crafts, um, you know, of architecture, drawing and model making, and and then, but responding in my art brain. So this was, was kind of an interesting thing. I rarely talk about it. And and then, you know, also during all of high school, I neglected to say, and, and through college, I was going to museums all the time. I was spending a lot of time um, walking through collections and 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 being exposed to things in self-initiated way. So, I mean, to me, education meant not being within the four walls of the institution. It meant using and absorbing all that was New York at the time. Yeah, I think that definitely New York has been a huge influence on you and your work. And maybe even as you mentioned the museums in New York because you've designed so many museums and also done editions and um, exhibitions at many of these museums as well. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you maybe about some of the work in New York and working in New York, um, especially within the art scene uh, and the city there. Uh, so particularly some of these institutional buildings, what was that experience like? Because maybe you were hmm. a bit starstruck to be able to work on these projects. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, when I studied architecture, I never really intended to be an architect. I just wanted to be an artist with, with a sense of space and much more sort of appreciation for architecture as an art form. Um, you know, eventually um, uh, some opportunities opened up and I was, you know, I, I, Rick and I were um, invited to uh, do some public art work um, and then some work in galleries um, and then museums. 
And then, you know, but always, you know, I always thought of myself as kind of like the blend of art, artist and architect. I, I never really needed to have a sort of title or, you know, or I didn't, you know, exactly know. For me, it was like totally comfortable to be in both worlds. Uh, however, you know, not the profession. And, you know, then some opportunities came up to do, um, you know, the first houses, you know, which were ideas like the slow house was, um, you know, really changed my view of architecture a lot. And I realized that, hey, maybe um, we could do something that yeah, involves a client and a deadline and, a, you know, and a budget and all of that. And um, I, I think, uh, you know, it wasn't until truly the first time that we were asked, that, that we were in contention for a museum project that I totally went all the way. And that was in 2000. And um, we were, uh, you know, because of our independent work, I think we were, and, and we had done a couple of architectural projects already. So we weren't total novices, but, um, but we were asked to compete for the Boston ICA. And, um, and, and at that point, I thought, you know, we were anti-institution, you know, I, <laughs> I mean, I, my whole education, thinking back, um, you know, Hans Hacke was at Cooper Union at the time. And this, um, you know, like critical view of the art world, you know, and the critique, the institutional critique was fundamental to my education. That is being suspicious of the institution and of systems of power and, you know, and it was quite political point of view. Um, so being invited to, into an institution to do work, it was always, you know, when we did that, we did the first, um, we're the first architects to be brought into MoMA, into the projects room to do an installation. Um, and, and, you know, we did it in a critical way, like criti critical about the institution of MoMA. <clears throat> um, so, you know, later on when we were invited to a competition to design a museum, I had to rethink entirely my position because all of a sudden um, rather than you know like the typical throwing grenades at the institution trying to break down the walls I had to actually build the walls and imagine the walls of the institution <laughs> not only being there as an artist but like actually for other artists and so and who was inviting us was you know a contemporary actually or someone maybe, you know, just a touch older, but someone that was, um, uh, you know, a, a woman um, that was a director of the museum and, and just, um, you know, interested potentially in our, um, in our work. And we won the competition and we did our first museum. And, and I realized it was just as interesting to be from the architectural side, you know, making those walls as it is inhabiting them as an artist or throwing grenades at them as a dissident. Um, and, and, you know, from that point on, I realized that I could make more change walking through the front door than being on the outside of the, you know, of institutions, if I'm invited, you know, so that's, and, and then, you know, we went on to do other museums and other large scale projects like Lincoln Center, um, and, you know, we did the Broad just re more recently, we did uh, MoMA's expansion and the Shed, which was a total paradigm shifting project uh, for me. And, um, you know, and, and we continue to do it, but all of the, the work um, that came from before, from my early years, that independent work is still going on. You know, it has never stopped. It's just that more channels of architecture opened up to me. So doing independent installations, doing um, you know, performance work, uh, co-curating shows, um, exhibition design, books, um, uh, you know, education, teaching, um, you know, that's all part of my work. It's all extensions of the way that I think and I contribute to the world. And architecture is just one of them. I think that's really important because it, you are an educator, you still do a lot of installations and performance related art um, projects alongside the large buildings that everyone sees um, in the news. And I think that um, 
I would like to hear more specifically about some of the more recent um, performance projects that you had mentioned, or I had mentioned in your introduction. And I know your team had mentioned like the, um, in, the singers on the High Line um, or some of the other performances that you have coming up. Yeah, so um, the mile long opera um, was my brainchild and um, I, it, my studio had um, worked on the High Line for a very long time, since about, I don't know, 2003, 2004. And the High Line, as it grew, was done in chunks. So, um, you know, as there was more money to continue working on it, like the next 10 blocks were done and the next 10 blocks and the next 10 blocks. So, um, so we were um, working on this project for a very long time. And the High Line, um, uh, when it started, it was in a quite depressed area, meatpacking district full of um, just empty parking lots. Um, and, it, you know, the, a lot of the meatpacking um, industry had left New York. And so it was pretty desolate there. Um, and the High Line was um, uh, basically a railroad um, that was there for just the distribution of industrial stuff, you know, into this um, light manufacturing area of Manhattan. And, and so, but it had gone fallow for, you know, since uh, 1980, so it was not used and it was a kind of a ruin and overgrown. So um, anyway, we did, there was another competition. We won that competition um, to transform the High Line into a park. And, um, and that was um, tr totally transformational for that part of New York. Um, so what was a depressed area where the real estate was, was nothing. In fact, all the uh, developers wanted to, um, you know, uh, uh, wanted to raise the High Line because it devalued their properties. Um, what happened was the inverse, that the High Line, that park, raised the property values tremendously. And um, inadvertently, it became um, a place for more wealthy people. And a lot of um, you know, people that were living there already and businesses that were still there were displaced because um, the High Line had, you know, um, uh, you know, had, had uh, become so, so popular and it did... Um, uh, uh, sort of raise the, raise the rents to a large degree. And, you know, it, the, the city of New York was not conscious of how to make an equitable change, you know, if this were successful. No one expected success. Um, so when we thought about, when we were uh, arguing, you know, even when we won the competition, the project was not real until the city truly backed it. Um, and it took a while to prove that you can do a park in the sky. Um, so fast forward to um, a point where much of the High Line is built and, uh, you know, it, it gentrified that entire area and lots of glass and steel buildings built all around it. And there was a lot of anger because the High Line was very crowded, you know, and it was like most popular tourist attraction. Initially conceived of for 400 people, 400,000 a year, maybe. 8 million people um, went just before COVID in one year. So, you know, it was just crazy. Um, anyway, at that time, um, uh, I realized that uh, the Highland wasn't as much loved as it was initially. And I wanted to do a critical piece about gentrification, about displacement. And I wanted to do it on the site where it happened, on the High Line. So I um, uh, you know, my, my idea was to do um, an opera. Um, it would be called the Mile Long Opera. Actually, the High Line is a mile and a half long, but it, for ease, the Mile Long Opera. And it would involve, um, uh, you know, bringing together talent, um, a composer, writers. Um, we would be doing the whole sort of, um, we would be doing everything, basically, my studio and I directing um, and uh, ultimately being, you know, producer, director, creator of this. So it was um, David Lang um, was the composer, who's was really brilliant. Um, and Anne Carson and, and Claudia Rankin were the two poets that um, we brought in to write the, uh, the lyrics, the words that were, to, uh, that were then sung or spoken. And it was for 1000 singers on the Highland. And these singers, 
were all um, uh, New York based. Uh, they were s s uh, like 750 of them were from high school choirs, from church choirs or community choirs. So they were non-professional singers and 250 were professional singers and they were all sprinkled together and they were um, spaced out along the High Line, sort of like 10 feet apart, one from each, uh, from another. And they were singing um, um, these pieces that were sort of uh, conceived for that part of the High Line. And as an audience member, you would come, you know, at the Southern end and you would make your way all the way through the mile and a half and end up um, at uh, 34th Street having passed across 1,000 singers and each with a little solo piece. And it was, you know, it took years to do this, um, but what was very important for me, and I won't tell you the gruesome details, but I learned a lot about producing, directing, raising money, um, um, figuring out how to unite 1,000 people, you know, it spread out over a mile. It was like one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, it was incredibly successful for seven nights in New York. It was, um, you know, just like the city sort of came together um, in those moments. We, you know, we had to figure out how to ticket, how to bring people through it was free. Um, but, you know, it, it was, uh, it, it, there was something um, that really brought all the earlier thinking about the institution together with a later work and a kind of criticality toward um, you know, what the work actually meant, you know, in, in our culture. And so um, to really break up, break open the walls of opera and the traditional stage for the opera, to really think about um, uh, an urban setting as a place for an event, a cultural event to happen, like an entire city, like a chunk of the city, um, to think about professional, non-professional people coming together, you know, to do something unique, like something they've never done before. Endurance singing was what it was. Um, and to really make it very site-specific, like a site-specific piece about the High Line, what happened, but that could be um, brought to other cities of the world, post-industrial cities where, um, uh, you know, the speed of change happened so fast that, um, that there were, winners and losers in those stories about, about civic change. And that's what this was about. And that's why I, I needed to do it and it was more important than any other work at the time when I was, uh, when I was involved in it. So, you know, this just to say, you know, and I, I mean, since then, you know, there was um, also another piece with Bill T. Jones called Deep Blue Sea and was all about race. It was at the Armory. And it was Bill's piece, we were involved, I was involved in you know, all of the sort of physical aspects of it and also working with Bill on the content and you know, right from the start. But the Mile Long Opera was more representative of me initiating a piece from scratch with no help uh, and you know, putting all the parts together from, from zero. That's really beautiful. I think that um, being able to achieve that and then also um, its location in New York and the, the fact that it really reflects the city as a place and its culture and community by the people who are participating and viewing and interacting with it is really important. Um, one thing I'd also like to think about in your work, um, and maybe it's more in some of the earlier work, but also the way that you speak of this project about who are the participants and who are the audience, um, is this kind of blurred lines of like who is making the art or who is perceiving it. Um, one thing that I, I think about is um, in the slow house, the kind of importance of viewership and viewing um, and same thing with the Brasserie restaurant, which was an early project um, where the uh, people entering the building are part of the experience being projected on the TVs over the bar. Um, and several other projects, you've kind of played with these tropes of the audience being part of the pieces. Um, and I wonder if also some of Guy Debord's um, theories of spectacle have influenced a lot of these ways that you think of audience and performance and experience. Yeah, I mean, that's an, it, it's an important reference actually. Um, the, you know, that notion of um, this city 
as like something that is performance and discoverable and and that um, you know uh, uh, that it's it's really a kind of lens through which to see near and far you know detail and systems at the same time and you know I think that early you know critical writing was very influential especially when I was um, in college and I started teaching and um, you know the notion of spectacle and and sort of like redefining what spectacle was I think uh, uh, was important but you know as I think about spectacle and what it really means um, vision and visuality were always fundamental. Um, that is the relationship between a viewer and, um, you know, oneself in the mirror, you know, just that, that very small space, the smallest space maybe between uh, a viewer and something. And then, you know, thinking about um, spectatorship in the museum, you know, what is that line of authority, you know, that, that, that division between, you know, what you can touch and what you can't, where you can go and where you can't, the edge of the stage, you know, and what are those sort of forms that define that relationship between um, viewer and viewed, uh, proscenium, the window, you know, all, all those things keep coming up in the work. Um, and the frame, you know, is this, um, sort of legitimizing thing. And that's what the, the slow house was all about that, that, that that view where the house was perched, uh, the slow house, um, the view is always there, but it isn't until you put a frame around it, you know, in the house where it becomes somehow highly valued. And that's a piece of that frame that frames the view, the horizon, and that sort of view to the sea, that distant view. Um, you know, that's called an ocean view and, um, and, and, and it's highly valued in real estate to have that ocean view. And, and when someone builds a house, they want to, they want to capture that. Um, and, and the soul house was all about sort of critiquing it and questioning it. So uh, the whole piece is about a door that leads to a window and the whole house is just, is just the sort of reconciliation of a door to a window. But um, in that window, there was also a, a, a mediated view. There was a big monitor in front of the big picture window, and there was a camera outside mounted very high up on a, uh, on a perch. Um, and it looked out onto the view and brought the same view in to a monitor that was seen against the view through the glass window. And except the horizon line was slightly displaced. And, and the whole point of this, the house started to be built and it stopped because of the market collapse. But you know, it was almost built. But the it was a house that was an idea, and and the point was that um, that mediation happens in lots of different ways. That the framed view by architecture is just as mediated as um, an electronic view on the monitor. Um, and also, what makes mediation bad from you know, authentic experience. I never understood that. I always thought that they were both valid and important. So those multiple themes come up really early in the slow house and have basically uh, trailed me like the whole time. I mean, I still am obsessed with, with, those, uh, with those issues. Yeah, I think that that media is something that you've played with so much in your work and how to represent things that are uh, kind of normal or like a view that obviously the view existed before, uh, but then you've reframed it in new ways. I think that's something that carries through in so much of your work that's really important. Um, we should start wrapping up the discussion yeah. though. Um, so I have a few kind of general questions um, about your overall career, um, perhaps one of them being, what was one of the biggest challenges that you faced and how did you overcome it? Mm. It's interesting. Uh, you know, I I don't think of, uh, you know, maybe COVID. Uh, you know, I I I'm just thinking like I actually, you know, the way my career went was it was very organic somehow and very natural. You know, doing more work. Um, I never had to do work I didn't want to do. 
Uh, I, I, you know, except for a very short time, I never worked for anyone. So I, I never sort of felt um, like hemmed in at all. So Rick and I started um, our practice very soon after I finished school. I, I had a, um, you know, a, uh, you know, I had this residency in Rome and I went, I went to Rome and then we started doing architecture and art and, and, uh, and it's been sort of growing and growing and different opportunities. And so I really never felt um, in any kind of negative way challenged. And I know that, you know, I'm, I have to, I have to say like, I'm a, um, you know, I, I happily inherited all the breakthroughs that my uh, female precedents have, you know, have, have made and, and they broke through, um, you know, and I actually, you know, as a woman in architecture, I have to say, I never really felt, you know, that kind of barrier, but it, it's very important that, you know, I, I don't think I would have felt that way if I was anywhere other than New York, because New York was, you know, pretty much as progressive as you can get. And so there didn't seem to be many barriers. Um, I think maybe one of the sort of, if I had to think of something, um, I think that architects sort of dismissed us as artists and artists sort of thought we were architects. And so we were felt, uh, you know, we were right in between things and in a way having no definition um, didn't allow us to um, do some projects that we wanted to do or get funding, you know, to do some things that we wanted to do. We overcome that. We overcame that by, you know, a lot of credit card debt, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, which we had to pay off later on. But, you know, just thinking back on it, um, that, that was, uh, you know, I think that now when I uh, think about how architects, the, the sort of the difficulty, I have a, an office of over 100 people and um, we're doing many projects at the same time. It was very hard for me to put more than one project in my head, you know, in my obsessive way, doing two things. It was splitting my focus was very difficult. Then three ways, then 10 ways. Um, running a studio with all the complexities of running a studio, which are not just the design, you know, and just the financial aspect of keeping the studio open, but just every issue that you can imagine. It's very complex and managing something big um, is sort of hard and challenging. And that was, um, that's been super interesting. But every once in a while, I think, wow, wouldn't it be easier to just um, do what I used to do and just, you know, between art and architecture and performance um, and do it sort of in a smaller, tighter group. Uh, and then I changed my mind because you know, we're able to do large scale projects um, in urban contexts that are permanent. And that's something that I never really valued when I was younger, but to plant things in the earth and to have them change the way people use the city, to have the city change because you've made interventions in it. And, you know, when you, you know, you started with, you know, uh, talking about New York, I mean, We've worked in different parts of the world, but there's something about living in your own city and transforming it, and then being able to go as a museum visitor to MoMA or you know to hear a concert at Lincoln Center and like feel like you've touched it and you've made a difference, or to take a walk on the High Line. You know those are um, so such incredible um, like experiences because they're. You, you are both a citizen and an author at the same time. And, and your work, you could, you could be anonymous, you know, in those contexts and watch people enjoying themselves. And they didn't, they don't, you know, some of them don't even remember what it was before, you know, because it's transformed and there wasn't a before. And it, it's, it's very interesting because you feel your place in the cycle of change in a city. Um, you know, and the city is like sometimes, you know, growing and being reborn and sometimes is depressed and dying, you know, and then it has to be reborn and finding yourself in those life cycles of the city is really mind blowing. That's great. I mean, I really do think there is a love for New York within your work um, and the way that you have changed and really left a mark on the city is 
amazing, particularly with like the High Line and also um, the Shed as an interesting project that itself is somewhat of a performance because it too moves and changes uh, and so it's almost like a very large art piece that's continually adapting. Um, so as we wrap up, I guess the, my final question is, do you, what are your inspiring words for young architects or students of architecture as they begin to enter into the field? Okay, well, I, I, I will just touch on the shed for a second and just say that that was unusual in our all of our work in that, like the Mylong Opera, it was self-initiated more or less. So a response to an RFP from the city, no client, no, no budget, no fee, no nothing, you know, an idea, an idea that through perseverance, we convince more and more people that it should be done, that it must be done and following through as you know, also a client sitting at the table with lawyers and, um, you know, uh, Dan Doctoroff who became the, the first uh, chair um, and just thinking it up, you know, from the beginning and, and uh, not only uh, a structure, but a new brand new institution, a startup. And so my, uh, you know, and, and now here it is, it, 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 it's, um, you know, it's this paradigm shifting uh, art uh, uh, intersection of visual and performing arts, you know, that bring all sorts of audiences together and this expandable building never been done before. Um, so what, uh, you know, my parting words to students is, um, you know, like dream big, think big, um, don't be shy, uh, follow your passion, uh, you know, do what you have to do to get things done. Like I think it's in my, in my time, I was able to get grants. Maybe it's harder to do that now, but maybe you work in an office, but you work on the side. And, you know, if you're truly have a sort of independent brain and you want to um, sort of break out, um, you know, do your own thing in parallel. Or if you're in school as a student, you're, you're, you're doing your you know, your brief from your faculty, challenge, you know, like feel free to challenge what's been put in front of you. Like we have done, you know, I had done with in my student years or in my late, you know, when, when I started working, there's nothing that's written in stone that, that life changes, society changes very fast. Architecture is very slow and cumbersome. You're in a field that, you know, has to redefine itself all the time, really, to stay, um, you know, to, to stay alive, really, because, you know, developers will just do it faster and cheaper. But, you know, architecture is more profound, it's more lasting, and slower. And, but do um, uh, think broadly across disciplines. Um, and, um, and, and also politically think of where you are in time and space. And, uh, and, you know, sometimes when you step out later on, um, you know, take a chance, do what you think you're unqualified to do. <laughs> and that's what we did with the Shed and the Mile Long Opera, and they were very successful. We were not qualified to do those things. But, you know, with, with, a, with a vision and a passion, you could really get, get a lot of things done. You know, and it takes some naivete. Hold on to that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think that's absolutely great advice. And I think it comes from your rebel youth where you were in school tossing things out windows with college students um, all the way to your curious view of the world that you get from this art background and being surrounded by people who maybe see the world a bit differently and you see the world differently and are willing to reflect on the city and the place where you live. Um, so I think that's really great advice for everyone. And um, thank you so much to uh, speaking to us today. Thank you for all this wisdom. And I love seeing all your projects. Uh, so hopefully there are more coming soon, um, particularly these more inventive ones that really are generated by yourself and less so than clients. Um, although those have all been amazing as well. 
Um, is there anything else you have to say or? No, just got to go to work. <laughs> All right. Okay. You have a wonderful day. Thank you okay. so much for speaking Thank with you, us. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. See you.